traffic's one of them you guys know well the dallas cowboys are a close second those two are like 1a and 1b and then 1c is now air horns and cowbells at graduations honestly i mean they tell you at the beginning please respect the dignity of the ceremony and then somebody's like hur, hur. i'm like dude i mean they just said it you know and i was really mad because my air horn didn't work that i brought no, i'm just kidding i would not do that if you have your bible turn to james chapter 3 ron stole my thunder a little bit i was trying to think of a maybe a joke to um start the, the message off today because I have a serious story I want to tell. Uh, and I was going to show that, that story of Miss Ruth, who's our servant spotlight, and say that someone had texted me during the announcement saying, hey, when did Ruth take that picture with you? But Ron stole my thunder and said that was a picture of him. But you can imagine how hurtful that would be if you had texted me that, right? Because <laughs> I haven't looked at my phone yet, but if I find that text somewhere, that would be very hurtful. Any American Idol fans in here by chance? I was kind of more old school American Idol fan when, uh, unfortunately, I did enjoy when Simon would have his ruthless uh, um, words toward the contestants. But one of the most successful um, contestants on the show was the actual season one winner, Kelly Clarkson. On the final episode when it was on Fox before it moved over to a, a different network, Kelly Clarkson was, was asked to come back for a performance of a song that she started writing when she was 16 years old and then finished it when she got married. The song is called Piece by Piece. If you've never seen the video, you can go on YouTube and just type in Kelly Clarkson, American Idol, Piece, Piece by Piece, you'll see it. It was one of those rare moments on that show where the judges who are all either producers or professional musicians who've been around a lot of music, heard a lot of songs, seen a lot of performances, but across the board, the judges were moved to tears in a very rare moment. If you've never heard the song, Kelly Clarkson actually wrote the song about something that happened to her when she was six years old. Her father walked out on their family, and she was wa watching him as he, as he walked away. And then later in life, she, she was married and found a husband who uh, healed some of that. But in an interview with her, she talked about writing this song from that place of hurt of watching her father um, walk out on their family. And there's a lyric of the song. I want to just read them to you. It's in the second verse of the song. And so she's speaking in this song to her father. All of your words, they fall flat. I made something of myself and now you want to come back. But your love isn't free. It has to be earned. Back then... I didn't have anything you needed, so I was worthless. Now, when she's writing these words as a grown adult, married, now with a child, you can feel the anguish of her heart, can you not? You can feel the hurt that she experienced. In fact, later on in the chorus, she says this often, it repeats throughout the song, piece by piece, he filled the holes that you burned in me at six years old. You've probably heard the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. The actual uh, origin of that was names will never hurt me. It appeared for the first time in a printed article in the late 1800s. Uh, a young lady wrote the article and wrote about being called names and how those names would ultimately not define who she was. However, you and I both know that words are powerful. And they are damaging. Words can be used for both good and for evil. In fact, you know that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can break you even more. A word said in a moment, a word said in an unguarded moment of, of anger or rage can last with you a lifetime. Proverbs 18.21 says this, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. I want you to let that soak in for just a moment. Your tongue, with the words that you speak, have the power to speak life or to speak death. Now, I want you to think about the various people that you interact with and speak with. And I know in our culture, it's a little bit different today because you can actually ask young people, hey, did you talk to your friend? And they said yes. And then you find out that they didn't actually talk to them in person or on the phone 
For them, communication, words, are texting them, or sending them a DM, whatever it might be. And so I want you to just think about the people that you communicate with using words, whether they might be words that you speak or words that you send via text. Those words have the power to give life and death. Let's, let's do a little te uh, test here for a moment. What's the best compliment you ever received? Now, I might take you a minute to think about that. What's the best compliment, the nicest thing that someone said to you? But you might think of a parent who said something, maybe a spouse, maybe a coworker, whatever it might be. We could take those moments and we think, okay, yeah, that was good. I received that compliment and it felt really good. But then here's another question. What's one of the most hurtful things anyone has ever said to you? And it's likely that you didn't take as long to find that second one as you did the first. Because those damaging words are very powerful, and they stick with you. Mother Teresa once said, kind words can be short and easy to speak, but their echoes are truly endless. In the book of James, in James chapter 3, the passage we're going to study today, for those who have missed, we've been studying through verse by verse through the book of James, and now we get to James chapter 3, and James reminds us just how powerful our words can be. I'll remind you of a few verses that we have uh, read or studied through this series. In James chapter 1 and verse 19, James wrote, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. In James 1, 26, If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. In James chapter 2 and verse 12, what we studied last week, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. In other words, as believers in Christ, we need to speak and act in a way that we acknowledge that we are going to be judged according to the words of God that are written in his word. In James chapter 4, what we'll study later, he says, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. So it's obvious in what James has been saying here that there have been problems in these Christians about their words about maybe using words to backbite or to cut each other with their words. I want you to look in James chapter 3 in verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now I want to pause there for just a moment. James begins this teaching on our words with an interesting instruction, an interesting warning specifically for people who desire to be teachers and he says at the beginning of that verse not many of you should become teachers in the early part of James chapter 2 you remember that that passage was about the sin of partiality that within the body of Christ we should not treat people with preference over someone else based upon their appearance based upon their economic status based based upon their social status whatever it might be we should show no partiality in the body of Christ in the way that we love one another and if you'll remember from that study, we talked about that in that culture, there was this really important mi or a mindset uh, in the people, and that was that to find a place of prominence, either at a feast or at a festival or at some kind of gathering, was a big deal to them. They loved titles, and they loved places of prominence. In fact, on the screen, you'll see here Matthew chapter 23, verses 6 and 7. Jesus, speaking of the Pharisees, said this, And they loved the place of honor at the feast and the best seats in the synagogues. Remember when we studied that passage that James talked about, that when someone comes in your church, comes in your gathering, you shouldn't look at their appearance and say, Okay, they look like they're wealthy. They look like they're well off. We're going to give them a place of prominence in the church just based upon what they see. That we should never be partial in the way that we love people and the way that we treat them because that's in line more with what the Pharisees were doing. But notice in verse 7, and they greet in the, in the marketplaces and they love being called rabbi by others. So there was this idea that the Jewish people would try to uh, go after and that was if I could get to a place of prominence, have a seat of prominence, then people would call me rabbi or teacher. And that same mindset had infiltrated the church. 
In other words, if I become a teacher, if I become someone who is seen as someone who is knowledgeable and can expound upon the scripture, then that will give me some kind of influence or power or authority in the church. And James warns them that not many of you should become teachers. And the reason for that is very simple. Those who teach will be judged with greater strictness. I recently asked someone in the church if they would consider praying about in the summer, later in the summer, preaching a particular message that I felt like they would be uh, very, uh, equi- very well equipped to speak on. And the person said, well, it depends on the topic and it depends on the amount of time. I don't, be, I don't mind being made a fool in, in some areas of my life, but when it comes to handling the word of God, I want to make sure that it's done really well. Even when I was a kid, I had a lot of opportunities in high school. I was the Fellowship of Christian Athletes president. I was the National Honor Society president. I had opportunities in a lot of different ways to speak in lots of different venues. But when I became a pastor, I realized very quickly there is a difference between public speaking or, and communication and preaching the Word of God. And the difference is the weight of the subject, the weight of the subject matter, but also the one that you are representing. It's one thing to go into a, to a, a, a room of people. And I've been asked to go to high schools, for example, and talk about the dangers of drug use. And so I've had opportunities to go into schools and, and speak on a, on a big subject like that and speak from my firefighter experience with some of the things that I saw there and, and seen in my own ministry life the, the effects of, of drugs on people's lives. It's not a problem to speak about those kind of issues. But to stand up in front of people and open the word of God and try to preach the word of God, I understand there is a greater accountability and strictness and responsibility when preaching the word of God because I'm not just representing a concept out here like drugs are bad for you. I am representing the God of heaven who breathed his word out on the pages of the Bible. And my job is to not only preach the word faithfully, but to live in a way that I understand that there is greater judgment for those who would be teachers. And so James warns them, not everyone should be trying to become a rabbi. Not everyone should be so eager to become teachers. Paul wrote a warning in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. They'll be on the screen as well. For I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. And then watch this. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and will disclose the purposes of the heart, then each one will receive his commendation from God. The idea that, that Paul is putting forth there is that it is the Lord who judges us. So any person, it's not saying that we shouldn't want to be teachers. In fact, we should be seeing people called into that and trained and equipped, but we shouldn't be doing it so flippantly without really realizing that to become a teacher means that you are opening yourself up to greater judgment. Because when we teach, we represent the one who wrote the words. So as a teacher of the word of God, you have to speak the truth. You can't get to certain passages of the Bible and just say, well, I don't really like what that says, or that's going to be a hard one to preach, and just skip through it. That's one of the reasons I love preaching through books of the Bible. It forces you to, to look at and preach every verse that you find without kind of getting on your soapbox topics, you know. Sometimes preachers you'll find, they're highly political. So they stand up, and every week they're talking about, uh, you know, Republican versus Democrat. They're talking about getting new leaders, and I think there's a time and place for speaking on political issues. But what we are called to do is to preach the word of God and to do it faithfully and with an understanding that we are living our lives in a way that lines up with what God has said in his word. Here at the Brook Church, we have a membership class for those who are considering joining. And at the last membership class, someone simply asked the question of, well, when can we begin to serve? And one of the things that we do here in our church is that you can serve pretty much right away. However, if you're going to exert spiritual influence in someone's life, there is a, there's a time of testing. There's a time that needs to pass before we just allow anyone to teach the word of God. And the reason for that is not because we think we're better than anyone or that we're a judge sitting on a throne in any way, but we have a responsibility to make sure that we don't make someone a teacher before they are ready for that responsibility. So James tells us not all of us should be teachers. And in verse 2, he builds on this. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man and able also to bridle 
his whole body. Now, there was only one perfect person, and who was it? It was Jesus. So to those teachers in verse 1, he says, don't be so quick to want to do that because there's a greater judgment. And then he says in verse 2, we all stumble in what we say from time to time. And so because of that, we need to take what James is writing about with utmost concern. And so in verse 3, James begins laying out some incredible imagery about the power of our words and what we say. Verse 3. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. They, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So he uses, first of all, the imagery of a bit in a horse's mouth. How many of you love going to the rodeo in Houston? You know, we, we like our metropolitan rodeo. You know what I'm saying? We don't want to be out there, you know, leaning up against the fence post where all the dirt gets on us. We like to be in our nice AC dome, you know, out there. You know what I'm talking about. But I love walking through uh, uh, the, the place where they have all the horses and all the animals, the livestock show. And one of the things that's fascinating, especially about these professional horses, and there are pro horses apparently. There's like amateur horses and then there's pros. I didn't know that. They sign contracts, I think, with their hoof. I don't know how that works. They like stand and say, yeah, I agree to be ridden for three years here and I'll run over, you know, two barrels a year, whatever it is. I don't know. But when you see these horses, they are fascinating animals. And when you look, especially at their back legs, I, I'm fascinated by just the ability, even through all that hair, to see the muscles, to see the tone and the definition of these animals. And when they take the still shots of them going around the barrels, these horses are powerful. The speed with which they, they, they go. And so I was really excited a couple years ago. Leslie and I were on a couple's retreat for adoptive parents. And uh, one of the activities you could do in the afternoon was ride horses. And I don't want to hear anything about it. All right, and so we, we decided we're going to ride horses. I'm not a huge horse rider. I am a big horse. I'm a big rider of horses, but I'm not like, I'm not big into that. And so we get out there, and so they line up all the people. This is a true story. And they kind of line you up, not, not shortest to tallest, but like strongest horse needed to weakest horse needed. You know what I'm saying? And they look at me, and they're like, where's the Budweiser Clydesdales? You know, like, just bring one of them out here. We can't have... You know, our little runt over here carry this hoss. And so get out there on the horse. You know, I got this massive horse. I mean, just huge. And it's amazing that this huge horse with all those muscles, with all that, you know, energy and ability to run and the strength and outweighs me by a, look, by a ton. By, I almost said a little bit. By a, t <laughs> by a ton. You can control this horse by just pulling the rein to the right and left or pulling back or letting loose on it. Because that horse has the bit in their mouth that controls that entire horse's body. You can make this horse turn right by a small little thing that they put in that horse's mouth. I'll tell you another story about that really quickly. This won't have anything to do with the message, but you'll like it. <laughs> this was the, like the most boring horse ride I've ever been on in my life. And I've only been in a few. Just walking through the woods. Man, my legs are hurting. And you can imagine the excitement. The leader who sees it's all adults riding the horses says, we're going to do something that we don't do at the camps because that's all teenagers. We're going to do a charge across the field, kind of like they did, uh, you know, in the old Civil War days. And I'm like, finally, awesome. We're not going to meander. They line us up, true story, line us up in all the horses. And the leader is right in the center of it. And then we're looking across this open field. And I'm so excited about this. And the leader goes, all right, ready, charge. And we walked even slower across that field. I was expecting this horse to like run or at least trot. I knew we weren't going to like sprint. I understood I wasn't a trained professional. But like we're walking across this field meandering. I'm like, what kind of charge is this? If this is the Civil War and they had the cannons over there, we're all dead. Like at least zigzag a little bit. You know, I'm not a professional horse rider or cannon person. But, you know, I'm imagining this slow target right here is going to be pretty easy for them to hit. In fact, with their old load rifles where they got to take it and you know, push the gunpowder, whatever they had to do, they'd have got like nine or ten shots off before we even got halfway. So anyway, that has nothing to do with the message. The point is, this horse is controlled by the smallest little bit in the horse's mouth. Um, I'll show you a, a photo of the icon of the sea. Some of you may, have, may know a little about, about this. This is the largest cruise ship ever built. It, it dwarfs the other ones. Um, considerably 
has an amusement park, a water park on top. I mean, it's got so many different decks. It's essentially a floating hotel called the Icon of the Seas. Uh, go to the next slide here. That ship is controlled by this rudder. Now, this is not the actual rudder of that ship, but, but very similar in what they do. As the water is being pushed, that rudder simply turns to the right and the left, and that floating hotel with thousands of people, so many tons of metal, can completely turn a different direction based upon that one little small part of the ship. And what James is saying in, this, in these verses is similar to that bit in the horse's mouth and the rudder of the ship. Your tongue can control every part of your life. Notice the beginning of verse 5, just the first part of verse 5. Sorry, my old eyes here. Let me catch it. There we go. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts great things. From the images of the horse and the ship, we learn this about our words. I want you to write this down. Words direct our lives. So choose them wisely. Your words can change the course and direction of your life, so choose them wisely wisely notice what he continues in verse 5 how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire and the tongue is a fire a world of unrighteousness the tongue is set among our members staining the whole body setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell for every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So encouraging, isn't it? Sounds so wonderful. Thanks for those encouraging words, James, about the power of words, right? Notice in verses 5 and 6 that the tongue is described as setting things ablaze. It is a fire. On October 25th of 2003, there was a fire that was started in the San Bernardino Mountains called the Old Fire. It burned... 91,281 acres over two days, over nine days, excuse me. 80,000 people were forced to evacuate their homes. Six people passed away as a direct result of this fire. There were others that passed away, but criminally they couldn't connect it directly to it in, in terms of being able to prove it in court. This fire caused $1.2 billion in damages. It is the second most costly um, wildfire in U.S. history that was started through arson. Ricky Lee Fowler intentionally set the fire by throwing a lit flare out of a white van and he was caught. Of the, over, of the 58 most destructive wildfires in U.S. history, 16 of them were arson. And in those 16 fires, 6,500 structures have been completely destroyed it's burned a million acres and killed 50 people. That's the power of just one flame. And I have seen churches completely decimated by someone who could not control their tongue. I've seen marriages fall apart because people in a moment of anger and rage said something hurtful to a spouse or to a child. I've seen countless young people when I was a youth pastor and when I did college ministry who came into my office for counseling or were seeing professional counselors because they had been hurt so desperately by, by their parents who demeaned them with abusive and hurtful language. I've seen friendships end because someone said something in an unguarded moment that hurt them. Words are powerful. Listen to the descriptive wording in verse 6. He calls the tongue a world of unrighteousness. If you've ever been to a small town in Texas or really any small town anywhere, small towns are kind of a, a smaller picture of, of the world at large, right? In small towns, there are people of influence, there are people of power, there are education systems, there are ways that those towns are funded, there's revenue streams. But throughout the, the culture of every town, there are pockets and segments of different people. 
There are church-going people and non-church-going people. There are Republicans. There are Democrats. There are people who follow God and live moral lives and those who do not. And those small towns are kind of a small miniature picture of the world. And I tell that to you because you, maybe at Christmas time, you're one of those people that have those little villages, you know, the, the villages where they, they sell them in different pieces. You can buy this house and, and then this hotel and it, you, you set it out. It looks really beautiful, this landscape. The idea there is all these different components represent a much larger town and that town is a much larger representation of the world. The Greek language that, that James uses here actually says that this is the tongue is like a little world in itself. In other words, what we hear from our mouths and the words that we speak are actually kind of a small miniature version of the evil that we see and we hear throughout the world. Think about the things that you've heard in the world. Slander, profanity, falsehood, blasphemy, abuse, anger, and in the tongue, you will find an entire world of that same unrighteousness. And he says in those verses, it stains the whole body. Your words have a pr profound impact. The tongue stains the entire body. When you look at your tongue in relationship to the entirety of your body, it's a very small part of your body. And yet, your words control and direct so many parts of your lives. I'm reminded of what he wrote in James 1.26 that we read earlier. And that is that if you say you're religious and yet your words are uncontrolled, you are deceiving your heart. But I want you to look in those verses in 6 through 8 and you'll notice that he says, The tongue is set on fire by hell. This is something that the Jewish audience whom James was writing would understand. The word hell there is actually the word Gehenna. If you ever have an opportunity to go to Israel, you'll know that there's a Hinnon Valley, which is on the south side of Jerusalem. In the first century, it was essentially the dump of the city. People would take their trash, they would take it to that valley, the Hinnon Valley, and then oftentimes they would set it on fire, and that fire would just be smoldering. It would burn all the trash and the refuse of that, that valley. My first job was roofing houses with my dad. My dad roofed houses, and he was a firefighter, and then... On his days off, he would roof houses. And so that was my first job, just manual labor. And at the end of the job, or at the end of the, when we would complete the job, we would take all the shingles and nails and all the felt paper and all the things that we'd put, we'd put it down, or the tar paper, excuse me, we'd put it down in this trailer, and then we'd have to take it to the dump. And it was the least favorite part of the job. Because when you get to the dump, the smell of that dump is overwhelming. If you've never had that opportunity, just go do it one day this week. Like, take your wife on a date, say, hey, there's a, there's a dump out here in, in Humble. Let's just go. Let's just do it. It's going to be amazing. You can pay for a bulldozer ride. It's awesome. No, it's not awesome. But when you go there, I mean, the moment you pull up, I mean, the smell is just overwhelming. Then as you get closer to it and you get inside of it, where you're actually taking all the shingles and throwing them out of the trailer. I mean, it is an overwhelming smell. And that same smell is what you would find in the Hinnon Valley in that first century. So you can imagine these Jewish people who had made trips to Jerusalem knew exactly what Gehenna was, that valley. And he's saying to them, that smell that you feel and that you sm uh, smell coming from that dump, that is the same thing that our tongues are in our lives. When we let our words go unchecked by the Holy Spirit, unguarded by the word of God and lacking the wisdom God of God, then it's like the garbage of our hearts has been lit and the odor is overwhelming. They are set on fire by Gehenna. They would have understood that language to be a reference to that burning heap outside the city. And then in verse 7, he likens it to an untamed animal. And then we get to verse 8, and I want to read it again for you. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. That first phrase of verse 8 reads like this literally in the Greek, kind of word for word. The tongue, no one of human beings has the power to tame. I want you to know something. I don't want this to be discouraging. But you do not have the power to subdue your sinful speech by your own power. That's not to say that your tongue cannot be controlled, 
But what I'm saying is, you do not have power over your own tongue. But if you know Christ, Christ can transform you. Christ can change you. And the only way for your tongue to be controlled is not because you, by your willpower, overcome it. It's Christ at work in you. In fact, at the end of verse 8, he says, Your tongue is a restless evil and a deadly poison. That means that the tongue running to evil doesn't rest in that pursuit, and it is unrestrained. Now, I spent some time in terror this week at my computer because I googled, quote, world's most venomous snakes. Anybody in here, like, deadly afraid of snakes? Can't stand them. They crawl on the belly. They don't have legs. They can move. Just pure evil. Satan chose the perfect thing to become in, 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 in the world when he chose to be a snake. They are awful to me. And on our uh, community Facebook page, someone will post a picture of a snake, and they'll say, what kind of snake is this? And I'm like, if it ain't dead, we don't care. Kill it. <laughs> But inevitably, you got somebody on there, oh, that's a good snake. I'm like, there ain't no such thing as a good snake. Like, they kill the rats. I'm like, I can get a rat trap at Home Depot, all right? Kill the snake, right? If you come to my house to this day, where, our, uh, where you come into our front door, there is a brick that has been chipped off on the corner, and that was done by me. And the reason was that when we first moved in the house, we had Sprint for our cell service. This is... Uh, not, I don't want to be sued by Sprint, but we could not get a cell phone signal through the sheetrock of our home. You know, we can put, we can put, you know, spaceships on the moon, but I can't get a satellite signal through that sheetrock. It's un incredible, but that happened. And so to take calls at my house, I had to walk outside. So I walk out on my driveway. It's nighttime. I'm on the phone, talk to the person. I'm not sure what they, we were talking about, but I remember was when I walked back in, there was a snake laying across the threshold of my door. That means I had stepped over that snake to take that call. So whoever that was on that phone call, I risked my life for you. You didn't know that, but I did. <laughs> when I saw that snake, I mean, I screamed the most girly scream you could ever hear in your life. I couldn't believe it. I about passed out right there. So I went in my garage, and I got a shovel. No, I did not go on to snakes.com or whatever else and say, is this a rat snake? Is this a, I don't care what kind of snake it is. That snake needs to die. The problem was I didn't have a flat shovel. I had only the ones with the point, and apparently when you're amped up with adrenaline over a snake, you can't aim very well. And so I just started chopping at that thing, and I missed it a bunch of times and chopped off the corner of the brick. And you can come to my house this day, and it's there as a memorial to that snake. Eventually, I did get at least a couple of good blows and then took the snake across the street and, and threw it in my neighbor's yard. The house was not built. Your house was not built at the time, but I knew that it would be taken care of. But it wasn't going to stay there, even dead. Because I don't know if they can come back to life or if they're like worms. You cut them in half and they grow a head again. I don't know. But we weren't going to take that chance. Threw it over across the street in the empty field. I share that with you. I found out that one of the, I knew this, but the black mamba is one of the most toxic snakes in the world. If you're bitten by a black mamba, you could be killed in a matter of hours. 45 minutes without any kind of intervention and you're going to be completely stopped. Here's the terrifying part. They move at 10 to 12 miles per hour. So after the service today, I'm going to get my Suburban. We're going to line up. And I'm going to drive across that parking lot 10 miles an hour. And you try to keep up with me. And I was terrorized because I thought if, the, if our enemies ever got wind of how deadly the black mambas are. And they wanted to attack the United States. They would just drop boxes of black mambas. And no, we can't outrun them. You see where my mind goes? This is where the mind of your pastor goes but when you're bitten by a snake what's one of the keys to living it's quick interaction why because when that venom gets in your bloodstream it begins to infect the whole body and james is saying your tongue is like deadly poison just the smallest amount a little cyanide pill in the world wars would kill someone the smallest amount of poison can bring about complete devastation so with james's description description of fire and animals and poison we learn this about words. Write this down. Words destroy others, so choose them wisely. And I'll get to this last point very quickly, verse 9. With it, with the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. 
Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Notice in verse 9. With the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and we curse the people who are made in the image of God. What's the greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. He says we love God, and yet we, we curse people. We bless God, and we curse the very neighbors that are made in the image of God. Let that sink in for a moment. In the Sunday service, we're worshiping God, but on the drive home, we're yelling at our spouse. We come together on church, at church and we sing songs, but when we go to the restaurant after church, we're rude and demeaning to the waiter that's trying their best to help you. We pray at church, but with our words toward our kids or our family or friends, we're controlling or abusive, hurtful, spiteful, vindictive. And that's what leads James to say in verse, three, in verse 10, Brothers, as believers in Christ, this is not the way that it should be. Your words should not be used in a way to hurt other people or to start fires or be like a deadly poison. Our mouths should not be blessing God and cursing people. This is not the way things should be. And when we speak those kind of words, we misrepresent the fountain of Christ that is living inside of us. That's the imagery of those last few verses. If I have a cup and I put something in the cup, when I shake the cup, what comes out of it is what was put inside of the cup. Many times you say things, or maybe you're like me, you say something, and in that moment, when you realize what you said was so hurtful, you say something like, I didn't mean to say that. Or we hear politicians or, or celebrities say, that's not who I am because of something they said. But Jesus said differently. Jesus said, that's not true. What you say is a window into your heart. In Luke chapter 6, verse 43, the verses will be up here on the screen. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. Your words are a window into your heart and soul. And from this, we learn this third truth about our words. Write this down. Words display our hearts. So I want you to just spend a moment analyzing your words. What do they reveal about your heart? Is your faith at work in a very real way in your life, allowing God to transform you? When Kelly Clarkson wrote that song, began writing as a teenager about 10 years after her dad left her family, those words on the paper are a window into her heart, into the hurt and the trauma that she experienced as a young child whose father walked away. And the same is true for us. The words that we speak are a window into our hearts. In verse 13, we'll stop here today and pick this up next week. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. If your words are out of control, if your words are not displaying who you would like to display in, in terms of displaying Christ, then what you need to seek is wisdom from God. Wisdom is displayed, James has argued, in our works. But wisdom is also displayed in our words. And I love that phrasing of verse 13. We'll talk about it next week. Show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So I want to ask you today, just stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I'm going to pray over us this morning. But as I pray, I wanted you to just ask yourself the question, is my faith real? Are the words of my mouth showing the heart of Christ in me? Our words direct our lives, so choose them wisely. Our words can destroy others, so choose them wisely. And our words display our hearts. 
So choose wisdom. Let me pray. Father, we recognize today the power of our words. And even in studying for this message, I've seen and been convicted that my words are not always reflective of the heart of Jesus in me. And so I pray for your people here today that we would choose our words wisely. Help us to recognize the power of the words that we speak. That our words direct and control parts of our lives. And our words can destroy other people. But help us to recognize today that our words are merely a display of what's in our hearts. And so, Lord, change our hearts today. Pour into us the things that are good and right and true. And take control of our hearts so that the words of our mouths might be pleasing to you. So that you would never have to say of us in our words, this ought not be so. But that what we say would be things that are pleasing to you. So I pray that you transform us and change us by your power. And we give this time to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.